Best Diet Foundation for Cervical Cancer. And I'm going to hand it over now. Oops. I'm going to hand it over to Paige to give us a little welcome. Hi. Okay. Hi, everyone. Again, thank you so much for having us here. We are, as Maria said, always excited and eager when we get these opportunities to talk about cervical cancer because it's something true and dear to our hearts and it can be easily prevented. So I know you all are going to leave with a lot of information today and we really, really are very excited to be able to share that with you. Right, so without further ado. Ayana was such a light. She lit up the court and she lit up our hearts. Ayana inspired everyone. She gave her all for her sport, her family, friends, and for her country. Even when she found out she had cervical cancer. Her fighting spirit got even stronger. She was determined to be an advocate for cervical cancer awareness to prevent other women from developing the illness. Ayana passed away in July 2018. She was only 32. But her battle against cervical cancer continues. We will carry it on. For Ayana, for your loved ones, for yourself. Get vaccinated against HPV, the virus that causes cervical cancer. For us and for our loved ones, we must protect ourselves against HPV and cervical cancer. Get screened today. Visit your local health center or doctor for more info. Okay, guys. So, one second. My computer logged me out. Very strange. Hmm. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, as you all would have seen in that video played just now, Ayana was a volleyball player, active, fit. We didn't show you any of those pictures. She was the life of the party. Best believe it. Young at heart and full with so much energy. And the last thing that we would expect was her to die from cervical cancer. When we speak about cervical cancer or cancer on the whole, I know oftentimes we think that it's just the person that's going through the illness or the disease rather, but it's a collective um, thing and family members feel it as well. Everyone that's in contact with these um, cancer patients, they do feel it. And from my personal experience, it's not great. It's actually extremely devastating. You feel so helpless at times because here you watch your loved one um, battling something that almost seems like an inevitable fight. It, it almost seems as though this is it. And uh, it sucks when you know that this can be prevented, when you know that there are things that we could have done to avoid them going through this, to avoid the emotions that we feel at this time, to avoid other families from going through what we go through. I'm saying all that to say, let me give you a little bit of the story of how, how we got the news and how that process really was for us as a family. So as the video would have explained, Ayana was diagnosed in 2018, Jan of 2018 to be specific. And I remember getting the phone call, I was away studying, and uh, my stepfather called to tell me that Ayana has cervical cancer. Remembered it like it was yesterday. A swarm of emotions came in, not sure what to think, but I could promise you that death was not even a thought because I genuinely felt that we were gonna beat this and Ayana being the type of person that she is and very competitive and such a positive person. I said, okay, well, this is it, let's do this. Everything is easier said than done. And sometimes things are out of your control. I remember before coming back home, I got a phone call and this was my family really warning me of Ayana's physical change. As some of you may know, um, 
cancer patients, they go, they go through um, weight loss and vast changes, right? I mean, you may watch somebody a month in apart from when they may have been diagnosed or started treatment. And sometimes it is mind blowing how different that person looks physically. And I will admit, if I did not get the phone call warning me just how much weight she lost and just how much she may not look the way that I, I left her, it may have been a lot worse for me on that, that first night being home. So I remember walking upstairs, excited to tell her I'm back from school, studying medicine. And of course, that's the semester we learned about cancer and oncology and all of that. So it, it really was a tough time being in school, learning about that, knowing that your family member is going through this same thing. But anyway, so heading upstairs and here we have a Yano laying in bed under the covers. And I kid you not, I thought it was just a skeleton underneath the cover. I was able to identify a bone. And she was asleep. So of course, you know, my initial reaction and face, thankfully, she would not have seen that. But I was in shock. I was in shock, sorry. And I thought to myself, okay, this is worse than I think it is. And it sucks that my aunt had to go through everything that she went through. I did not get to spend much time with her. I returned home in May and she passed away in July. The couple of weeks that I was home, however, I was her nurse, not a registered nurse, just a on-call nurse. Um, but let me just say that some days are very ugly and some days are not so ugly. But the ugly days are the ones that tend to give you the flashbacks in your head. And this is, wow, sorry. I don't usually get emotional. Wow. I am very sorry about this. I'm getting myself together. <clears throat> That's okay, Paige. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. Funny enough, Ayana's um, the death of her anniversary actually was two days ago. So I don't know if that's probably why this is a bit triggering, but I promise you, these tears are not sad. I am actually in great spirits, believe it or not. Um, but Ayana's last last wish, sorry, was to share her story because she understood that no other woman should go through this, especially because it's preventable. And I really can't wait for Moira to get into those details for us to really talk about the health aspect and how easy it is for us as women to really take care of ourselves if we make it our priority. If we put ourselves first, we really, really can do it. So I, I'm excited for Moira to explain all that to you, but I just wanted to share the side of the story that's not so pretty, the side that we don't really hear, the side that the patients don't like talking about, the fam families don't like talking about it. You know, we all try to grieve and remember our loved ones in so many different ways, but very often we forget that this cervical cancer is highly preventable and we really should not be here in 2021 hearing so many deaths and diagnoses on a daily basis. It's unacceptable. And I know as a foundation, as a organization, as a body, as women, as Trinidad and Tobago, and us on a global scale, we can prevent this and eradication is extremely possible. So with that being said, while I wipe all my crocodile tears away, <laughs> I would love for y'all to learn more about cervical cancer. And there's no better person to give you a little bit of insight on that than Moira Lindsay. Thank you, Paige.
Um, so thank you so much, Paige. Um, it is always, I, I've heard the story a lot and it is touching every time. And um, Paige's family started this foundation in Ayana's name and that was really her wish. And they are an amazing family you know, carrying on these message and, and, and sharing as much as possible, you know, how we can prevent it. So thank you, Paige. Um, I'm just going to go through um, what I have called here cervical cancer 101. Um, so some of it might be stuff, you know, some of it might be new. Um, it is, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going into doctor level. Um, but I hope to share the basics. And then we'll have time at the end, of course, for questions. So um, cancer, many of you know lots of different types of cancer. Cancer is a disease in which cells in the body grow out of control. Cancer is always named for the part of the body where it starts, even though it may spread to other parts later on. Cervical cancer um, starts in the cervix, so that is why it's called cervical cancer. Um, and there's a little diagram here for those who may not know uh, where the cervix is. Um, we sometimes do this presentation with secondary school students, etc. Um, some do not know where the cervix is, so we like to point it out. Cervical cancer, as you guys heard from Paige, is highly preventable um, because there's a vaccine to prevent the virus that causes cervical cancer, and there are very good screening tests as well. So when it is found early, it's highly treatable and is associated with long survival and good quality of life. So that's different from a lot of other cancers where, um, first of all, there's no vaccine that could, that could prevent the virus. Um, and cervical cancer takes can take up to 10 years to develop. So that's why if you're doing the screenings regularly, then you should be able to catch it. So that sort of sets it apart from other cancers that um, are not as preventable. It is the leading cause of death among women in Latin America and the Caribbean. So despite being highly preventable, it still kills about 35,000 women a year in the Americas. And the majority are in Latin America and the Caribbean. So the minority being um, the states in Canada. Today, we're gonna talk about the causes and what you, anybody on this call can do. It's uh, whether you're a woman, a man, um, an adult, a youth, everybody can do something that can help prevent cervical cancer. So the risk factors, almost all cases of cervical cancer are caused by the human papillomavirus, which you hear HPV, a common virus that can be passed from one person to another during sexual contact. There's many types of HPV. Some HPV types cause changes in the woman's cervix that can lead to cancer over time. Other types can cause genital or skin warts as well. HPV is so common that most people get it at some times in their lives. However, it usually causes no symptoms and you can't tell you have it. And for most people, it actually goes away on its own. But um, if it does not, there's a chance that it could over time cause cervical cancer in women. Um, both men and women get HPV. In men, HPV can cause cancers of the penis, it can cause cancer of the anus, back of the throat, including the base of the tongue and tonsils in both men and women. Other risk, risk factors for developing cervical cancer are smoking, having HIV, using birth controls for a long period of time, having given birth to three or more children, or having several sexual partners, but we always want to make sure the biggest message that gets across is that HPV is by far the greatest risk factor. So we still mention these because these are steps that you could take to, you know, to keep a healthy lifestyle or just to be aware of, but by far um, HPV infection is the greatest cause, greatest risk factor. But we can prevent cervical cancer together. So it's as easy as one, two, three, vaccinate, screen, and treat. So the HPV vaccine, some of you would have heard about it. Um, the HPV vaccine protects against types of HPV that most often cause cervical cancer. HPV vaccines work best if they're administered prior to exposure to HPV. And remember, we mentioned that HPV is passed in sexual contact. So it really is 
going to work best if it's introduced before sexual contact. So it's recommended um, to vaccinate girls between the ages of nine to 14 years. You can still vaccinate after that. You can also still vaccinate if you're a boy, but um, if you're over 15, you'll need three doses instead of two doses. Um, HPV vaccine is part of the national immunization schedule here in Trinidad and Tobago. It's free at all public health centers. And it's also part of the school vaccination program. So that's public, public primary schools. Um, millions of people around the world have received the vaccine without any serious side effects. Um, the most common side effect is pain and redness at the injection site. And um, as everybody here is aware, I mean, a huge thing right now, of course, is the COVID vaccine. So you hear about these type of things a lot, the common side effects for any vaccination. Um, we do encourage people to call their nearest health center to find out what day they offer the vaccine. The days vary. Um, there are some times, of course, um, that they might not have um, their doses, but they will tell you when they're getting them back. So always call ahead, um, you know, just to get the information. Um, screening. So that was vaccine was number one. Number two, screening. Um, the most common test to prevent and screen for cervical cancer is the pap smear or the pap test. I'm sure most people have heard of the pap smear or have had a pap smear if you're a woman. Um, the pap smear looks for pre-cancers, cell changes in the cervix that may become cervical cancer if they're not treated. Most doctors recommend you start getting regular pap smears when you turn 21. You'll hear different ages in Trinidad and Tobago because some doctors were trained in the UK, some were trained in the US, but 21 is a pretty average age that most doctors go by. Um, <clears throat> you can schedule, sorry, excuse me, um, schedule an appointment at a local health center where it's free. Again, it's the same thing as the vaccine over only on like certain days, usually it's one day a week at the health centers. Um, and they're also available at the Cancer Society and FPAP at a reduced cost, like cheaper than if you were to go to your private doctor. Even if you did get the HPV vaccine when you were younger, you should still get screened when you're older. We get that question a lot. And um, your doctor was best to guide how often to get your screenings, but it'll usually either be annually, so every year, or every three to five years, depending on your results. Lots of women in Trinidad and Tobago have never been screened for cervical cancer, but getting screened really could save your life. Um, a lot of women in Trinidad, their first pap smear is when they are pregnant and they have to do a pap smear, um, or if they're experiencing a problem and then sometimes it's too late. Treatment. Um, so even if you have an abnormal pap smear, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have cancer, so you can still prevent the development of cervical cancer by getting treatment. Um, and as we would have mentioned, a lot of, you know, you may have early stages and have no signs or symptoms, so that's why it's so important to get screened. And if you do get an abnormal result, you just will follow the recommendations of the doctor. Um, and like I said, if you have pre-cancer, the doctors can remove those lesions and prevent the development of cervical cancer. If the pre-cancer is not detected early enough, cervical cancer can develop over time. So that's most common for women who've never been screened or didn't keep up with their regular screening. So they might've done one when they turned 21 and then, you know, never again or 10 years later, et cetera. Cervical cancer is much harder to treat than pre-cancer. Treatments can include surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, things that you would have heard for other types of cancer as well. But together we can work to prevent cervical cancer. Um, we just put some resource, well, there's one here, PAHO. They have a lot of additional information. If you want to learn more, read more. That is the regional representative for WHO. And also some contact information if you want to reach out to us. And I'm going to leave this up while we open the floor for, well, first I'll pass it back to Paige in case you want to 
give any final thoughts and then we'll open it up for questions. Paige? Yes. Um, in terms of just to reiterate what Moira said, um, if you're not doing the screens or if you're not if you've never done a pap smear if you're not doing it on a regular basis you are highly susceptible to developing cervical cancer right and um in the case of Diana she would have gotten results where they were abnormal but she never went back and this was years after the fact so the science said it and I have watched somebody live through it and it's a fact so we are really really encouraging you to book that pap smear get yourself screened and vaccinate your kids please any questions i actually just have a comment hi moira it's sharon how are you hi Paige. we haven't met um, but I worked at PSI Caribbean back in the day. Um, I think it's important, especially with the lesbian and same gender loving um, women's community to stress the importance of getting screened because I remember years ago when we first started the Women's Caucus and we were having just one of our chat sessions and we asked, you know, has anybody ever gotten, ha gone to a gynecologist? just even visited a gynecologist. And the general response was, no, I'm not having sex with a man. Therefore, I don't need to, to go to a gynecologist or get screened. And that was a trigger. And we ended up, um, and this is years ago, as I said, we ended up having a gynecologist come and do a session with the woman, just stressing the importance of um, sexual health, irrespective of the fact that you're not engaging with a member of the opposite sex, especially if you're using um, to, um, toys and dildos and all of that, just the importance of a, a woman's health in general, especially in the vagina, whether or not you're engaging in sex with a man. So this is just my plug. Hear what Moira said, listen to what Paige went through. Um, and yeah, let's go and do what needs to do, what we need to do to stay safe and healthy. Thank you ladies for this. Yeah, that's a great point, Sharon. Um, hi Sharon, I love Sharon. <laughs> um, the, we actually, we developed a flyer together, our two organizations, and um, we, we specify that it does not have to be, that HPV can be transferred, um, and that's why they say sexual contact. It doesn't have to be penetrative sex. So we actually, in our flyer, we list that out. It, it's not necessarily vaginal or anal, or it could be any of the, you know, vaginal, anal, or sexual touching. And we, we actually spell that out. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Sharon, for bringing that up. Well, that answers one of my questions. I was going to ask if it's only through sexual penetration that you can get HPV. Um, another question I wanted to ask is, does it have like a HPV status? like a test that you can test for HPV status? Yes, so there is um, a, another, so we, we focus on the pap smear here because that is what is available in the public health system, but there is an HPV test um, that you can do right now in Trinidad. It's only available privately, but um, through our project, we were working closely with the Ministry of Health for a number of years, and um, the same machines that they procured to do the COVID testing, you know, Uncle Terry is always talking about all his, um, his little um, PCR tests, um, those machines can also do the HPV testing. And um, so it depends on the machine. Some machines just tell you if you're positive or negative. And some yes. machines actually tell you which type of HPV you have. Remember, we mentioned that there was hundreds of well, types. Know, yeah. Yeah. So they know which ones um, are high risk. So they know which ones can. I believe it was fourteen types that high risk. Correct. Yeah. So all the HPV 
test machines are testing for high risk. So even if you get the test that just says positive, that means you're positive for a high risk type, not for all hundred and whatever. Um, but the other machines and the machines that Trinidad does have, and so hopefully they will, um, you know, when COVID sort of winds down, hopefully they will start to use some of them for HPV testing. Those ones will actually tell you um, the specific genotype as well. So um, what you saying that, you know, you could contract HPV and it can go away on it or you could um, get over it on your own. Um, is it, does that kind of like really that you can have a genital wart and it, that could also go away on its own since like HPV causes genital warts? Right. So that's a very good question. Um, and it reminds me of one important thing. So um, because HPV is so common, they don't recommend the HPV test for women under 30 years because so many women under 30 will have positive tests. But um, if you're over 30 and you're still getting a positive test, that is when they say, okay, we should keep following up with this person. To answer your question specifically about the genital warts, no, those need, those do require treatment. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the HPV could go away on its own, but if it's already caused genital warts, warts yeah. please, ladies and gentlemen, um, do get um, treatment for your genital warts, yes. I have another question, quick question. So, and I asked it when we were doing, um, when they were promoting the COVID vaccine, and I said in an HIV forum, just to make sure that it's clear that if you're HIV positive, it was safe to get the, the COVID vaccine, and I was told yes. So this is the same question. Um, if uh, you're you're getting the COVID vaccine, is it okay to get the HPV vaccine? And just to make sure that it's okay, is my question. Yes, yes, great question. And yes, it is, especially because we know there's a high correlation of um, women with HIV who develop cervical cancer. So it's almost like, so yes, it is safe um for young people to get hiv positive people to get the hpv vaccine and um of course you would do it in consultation with your doctor and perhaps even more reason to because of that close correlation with cervical cancer and hiv someone in the chat asked if someone is considering getting vaccinated are there any thing one must take into consideration, like example, for allergies, medical conditions, et cetera? Um, no, they don't have any um, special um, cautions, I guess I would say, for the HPV vaccine. Um, so that it is so safe and that's why it's actually like included in the school vaccination program. Um, no, there's not any. So, you know, for COVID, they will tell you, make sure if you have blood clots or, you know, special mm -hmm. um, health issues to definitely speak with your doctor. Um, but no, there aren't any special recommendations um, for the HPV vaccine. So when I feel when the HPV vaccine started, right, that was like, I, I, I believe that's when I first got into this in school, right? And just how I have vaccine hesitation with COVID-19 now, it had that with HPV. So is it that the evidence-based research like correlate that the HPV vaccine is actually helping with cervical cancer? So now the hesitation has decreased? Hmm. Well, Makesa, <laughs> there are still a lot of challenges and Paige, you could chime in here because this is the work we are doing. We're trying to advocate for people to take these preventative measures, but um, there is still a lot of hesitation. I hope that it is um, decreasing now that there's a lot of evidence and there is, there's a lot of evidence now that the HPV vaccine has been 
available, especially in other countries for 20 years. So they have like 10 year studies to show the impact that it's had. Trinidad, we started in 2013, but we have not been doing any large scale studies or whatever. So the studies that are showing the benefits would be coming from other countries. Um, Australia has one of the longest programs. You can find a lot of information about that. So there is a lot of information, but of course, that is not, there's so much information in the pu public sphere, right? So most mm -hmm. average people are not reading some research paper <laughs> out of Australia. So that is why, um, you know, together we try to do this work. We speak to secondary schools. We go out, we've had outreach sessions in the community. I think you were more apprehensive as how the vaccine was like more targeted for children. Like how they, yeah, I think that's what made people apprehensive as well. Sure, because as it also dealt back that you are assuming that my child is having sex. Yeah, sex. Yes, that's what I mean. Because I want to give you the vaccine. You're saying that my child is having sex. That's the complete opposite. Um, but again, it's our responsibility to share the correct narrative to society because we are, with everything, as you know, you will have the one person who's going to counteract what you're saying or what you're doing. As you have, you clearly identified, and as Maura clearly um, stated as well, we have the research, we do have the studies that prove it. Unfortunately, we don't have that data specific to Trinidad and Tobago, because I know that I think as a nation, we may react better if we can see it firsthand here. But it's all a work in progress. <laughs> and we are very much committed to continue the fight, you know, to encourage persons to get vaccinated and to just take feed in their health as women. Sorry. It's okay. Um, someone asked, are there any reports of negative reactions to the vaccine? So um not um so if you if you Google that you will get some stories, right? So and so walking backwards or whatever. But um, no, not in the um, international data. What what um, there were rare cases of fainting, but fainting and then waking back up. But there was they could not tell if the fainting was just getting the needle. You know, like um, this was te this was teenage yeah. girls. Um, so there was no they couldn't prove whether it you know, exactly what caused it. But when I say, you know, fainting and then get back up, that, that has been the most, um, I guess, negative consequence that has been documented. Everything else besides that is just the, you know, pain in the site, redness around the site, um, just like you would get when you do your other vaccinations. Okay, so um, Thea said, I would say, if you are not getting regular medical screening, getting vaccinated may be the best option. As cervical cancer does not really have any early warnings. So by the time it is discovered or when signs begin to show, it is in the late stages. So, sure, it's such an important point. But I think what we can also take away from that is that if we are not doing the screening, which we should not be doing, we should be doing the screening yeah. because the, the reality is this vaccination um, drive or this this initiative is really, as we know, as, as um, World Health would, rec would have recommended would be for younger girls and boys, right? Nine to 14 years old, etc. Now we are you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, the vaccination part of that aspect of you preventing that we spoke about that we understand how that goes more than likely you would have already contracted hbv so you you then miss the boat but you miss the boat so the next step or the next responsible thing to do will be in fact to get screened because um these things tend to work hand in hand um like medicine it, every, and just like your body everything is a system it needs everything to work together so if you can be vaccinated and screened, that is excellent. That is the, the way that we would love for it to be. That would be the perfect world, but we understand that sometimes those things are beyond our control. Um, as Maury would have mentioned to you, 
Trinidad would have gone through its one or two droughts in terms of the vaccine and um, having that easy accessibility to it. So when we have these things limiting us, we also as women or as members of society, it's really, really important for us to be responsible and to work around it. Don't think that because you can't do one aspect to prevent it, you're just going to give up on the whole. That's not how it's going to work because best believe cancer doesn't give up if it doesn't find a host. It's going to find a new host. So you need to protect yourself and we need to do what we have to do. Um, I mean, I talk about this among some of my friends uh, and, you know, we put so much energy as women to book these appointments. So we get our nails done, our hair done. We glamour us, but we don't do the same when it comes to our health. The same energy, the same reminder you have on your phone to book your, your fill-in for your nail or to go get your lash extensions or blow dry your hair, whatever the case is, the, that same energy you take to feel nice, to look nice on the outside is the same energy you need to feel nice and to be good on the inside because your health is so much more than what's on the outside. What's on the outside is just that, just what's on the outside. What's yes. on the, sorry, but what's on the inside, it's, it's a lot. And as women, or in this case, this particular disease, we can get in front of it. It's, it's not one that we can't win. It's definitely a battle that can be won, you know? Paige, Moira, thank you very much. This is Faye uh, for all the information you're providing. But to add to what you just said, or, to, or should I say to say something, in our community, uh, because of discrimination and stigma and stuff that we face, many of our community members are unable to get the screening done because they are on the poverty line or beneath the poverty line and five to eight hundred dollars to go to a gynecologist is a lot of money that is somebody's rent in many cases or their food for the month in many cases so um yes fat has and other places have but again we face the stigma of walking into a room that truly does not invite us in and there are so many other obstacles to get the screening done. Does your organizations offer anything to the community or might be thinking of offering anything to the community to make us want to be even more um, willing to walk into that space to get the screening done? Of course. Um, Moira, do you want to? So funny you asked this question, you brought this up. Um, this would have been only because of COVID, um, we, have not been continuing it, but PSI Caribbean and ASDF actually, in association with Toronto Tobago Cancer Society, we started a mobile screening unit. So we reached out to, we were able to visit two communities rather, that was Diggle Martin, opposite Westby's, and in Shogonas by Pennywise, a complex. And we were able to give out free pap smears to women in the community. Of course, our wish is to continue um, this because we see how important this is. And as you rightfully said, Faye, a lot of people cannot afford it. It's not um, easily accessible. We, the reason PSI, Caribbean, and ASDF would have chosen these specific places is because we have heavy foot traffic. Um, we do, we are in areas where you will find all walks of life. So you're likely to be able to reach those members of society that may not necessarily guess what, be able to scroll through social media to see that um, a screening is happening or knows what the pap smear is about. Because best believe we have persons at those outreach that would come up and, you know, ask, so what is this? What is cervical cancer? X, Y, and Z. So it really gives us an opportunity as well to educate the public on that. Um, but I hear you loud and clear about everyone not having an equal opportunity, and that sucks. And as an organization, we, or as a foundation rather, we really, really feel strongly about removing that barrier because no one should succumb to cervical cancer because they could not afford a pap smear. Yeah, and just to add to that, um... We have worked uh, many, many years with FPAT and um, 
they have worked very hard um, to be inclusive. Um, so um, they've done put a lot of time and effort into, and, and perhaps you know there's always still barriers, um, but um, you know they really are there to provide a, a safe space for all members of community. Um, and I know, of course, there's the other barriers. You still have to get there. You still have to feel safe getting in a taxi. And those are, those are um, you know, other barriers. But I know um, in our work with, you know, PSI have, has worked together with FPAT for a long time to be a, a, a safe space. But um, I hear you that there's still a lot of work um, to be done. Can I also jump in here, um, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the community as well, um, one of the things that we've been <laughs> working on forever and ever um, is comprehensive sex education in schools, a curriculum that is inclusive. And if we are, if we, if we, when we get, not if, when we get to the point of having comprehensive sex education available to all children and maybe their families, that this could be a component that is built into that, especially since your target audience is such a, a young audience. So that's something that um, I think we will make note of as we continue to push for comprehensive sex education that is inclusive of the LGBTQI plus community that cervical cancer is something that is also, that should also be a part. I agree. I have two more questions. So um, my first question is, um, is there like evidence illustrating the way that HPV affects boys and girls or does it affect them both equally? Is one gender affected more than one? Well, I think um, the... The main difference, um, again, I want to say I'm not a doctor, um, but the main difference is really in um, the what HPV can cause. So we know for women, it is, you know, causes 99% of cerv cervical cancer cases. Um, yes. Cervical cancer is not a disease that men can get. Um, and the cancers that it can cause in men, there's not um, the same correlation, meaning that um, it does not cause 99% of cancers of the anus. So um, it puts, so it has a, a much more negative possible effect on females than it would on males. So in terms of vaccinating yeah, sure. both yeah, females and yeah, males. Yeah, because how you can get it, because with um, how you can get reinfected through sexual intercourse, it would be good to vaccinate the males to protect right. females further. Right. So it is available to an internet. It's available for both boys and girls, but. Um, because now there are these long-term studies, these ten-year studies, etc., um, that show. Um, they have compared countries, countries that have vaccinated both boys and girls and countries that have vaccinated only girls. And there is not, um, a, a, you know, there's a negligible difference in terms of the effect that it's having. But, but I must say the main um, reason that WHO recommends vaccinating girls is really a numbers game in terms of being able to provide that many vaccines to the world. So we see that kind of challenge happening now when the whole world wants COVID vaccinations, right? So um, it was only last year that the WHO launched this global um, drive to eliminate cervical cancer. So they're trying to get all these countries on board for, to vaccinate. And so all these countries are coming on board but that makes it harder to imagine trying to vaccinate all boys and girls in every country of the world, right? So um, it becomes very costly. So a lot of countries cannot afford to 
to in, you know, inoculate all boys and girls, but also um, it's harder to, to provide, you know, to keep up with the demand of the vaccines if you're doing both. So that coupled with the evidence, now they have the ev evidence to show comparing countries that did both versus countries that do just grow. So I would never tell a boy who wants to be vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. But if we are, um, you know, designing a campaign or putting our effort into where we're going to be doing like education campaigns, we might focus more on the girls' schools than the boys' schools, that type of thing. Okay, thank you. So not a question, but can you reiterate and in explaining the cervical um, cancer control with relation to the primary secondary and tertiary prevention? Sure. So, um, yes, I, the, I divided it for this presentation. I called it one, two, three, but not necessary. Actually, I guess it does sort of fall into primary, it secondary, does. tertiary <laughs> prevention. Um, so primary prevention, the number one is the vaccine. So this is um, stopping the virus from even um, from you even being able to get HPV virus. So that is that's number one. Secondary prevention is the screening. So that is um, screening. You're trying to detect if you do have the virus. And then the tertiary is the treatment. So not um, you know. So when we say treatment in terms of prevention, we're treating those um, abnormal abnormalities, sorry. So if you had an abnormal pap smear, you're treating those. So if you get a pap smear that's abnormal in Trinidad, they will usually send you now to go back um, and do um, like to take a closer look basically. So you will go, you'll go back to the hospital, the health center, and they will usually refer you to, uh, usually to a hospital. So one of the main hospitals, and then they're gonna take a closer look. And if they see anything, when they're taking a closer look, anything on the cervix, abnormal, they can actually get rid of those abnormalities right away. So that's the treatment as prevention. So one, two, three. Thank you so much. Is there any more questions? Do you all have any closing statements? Paige, you always have something to say. <laughs> that was her saying that I talk too much, but in a no. nice <laughs> um, No, but um, first, thank you for having us. This really has been great. The discussion was amazing. Um, you really got to open up the floor and have such a dynamic convo. I love it. But um, cervical cancer is a serious thing. And it is currently taking lives, lives that should not be taken. This can be prevented. And as such, as a community, we should make every effort to prevent this, to prevent yourself from getting this, to prevent your families and anybody in your circle from getting this. Um, at us as women in society, put ourselves first. Our health is our priority and your health is your wealth. So without it, we don't have you. And without you, what do we have, right? So it would be really, really nice that after this conversation, I encourage you to continue to do your research because I know there are a lot more questions. There are a lot more things that we can't answer because we're not medical professionals as well. But do your research, book your pap smear, vaccinate those that you can vaccinate and let us eradicate cervical cancer once and for all. Thank you, Paige. You're welcome. So I'd just like to thank everyone for tuning in with us today, joining on the Zoom and on Facebook Live. It was nice having you all, and we learned a lot on cervical cancer, and we learned on um, preventative measures and the importance of getting your pap smears. Um, I will especially like to thank Moira and Paige for joining us today and 
sharing your foundation with us and Paige, we really thank you for sharing your personal story with us. It has touched us deeply and it will make us think about um, our health. As you say, our health is our wealth. And um, yeah, we're really thankful. We're really thankful today to be edified and to um, be gifted with all this information to increase our livelihood, our livelihood, our lifespan and just be better people and what we learned today we could teach others because like um, Mara keeps saying she's not a doctor but um she's answering me well and everything she tells me I'm going to tell somebody else so I just want to thank you all so much for taking time to come and share with us share with our community we appreciate you all so much and we hope that you all come on with us again and we have more collaborations um I would like to share with us again, our team for this year is Power Her, which focuses on the struggle and yet the power of women and their history, which have helped build our movements. Power Her, um, women building our movements. We have an important role, women in society. We can't just cancel ourselves out. We are, are important and we, Women have a way of bringing things together. We can, we can take new props for that, right? So, um, yeah, um, I'm sad to express that self-defense would be postponed, but we are on for sure for mental health at 721. Um, I would also like to share with you all um, that during the month, the prime month of 2021, Cheryl and Tobago Transportation is hosting a uh, classroom with HIV awareness and education from Monday to Friday at 5 p.m. And all the information is available on all our social media platforms. Also, PrayTT has collaborated with Scotia Bank to expand its Generation Gap program. And it has, it's um, for persons between the ages of 17 to 25, where they will undergo a community-run mentorship program and if you want more information on how to sign up and on that, you can also visit our Pride TT website. So guys, I'm so happy that we could create this forum, this platform to share information and educate each other. Um, I'll see you all at 721. Bye.